Yeah. Thomas. Ah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. First. I, I think I just saw you first. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> Please go ahead. Thank you. you. First. Um, I just had a question about the conventions um, that you were talking about. So interesting. Um, and, and you showed the mixed deck, one in the beginning holding the water, um, and then the one in the um, in the Tlaxcala, like the representation of water. Does the representation of water change in that 100 year period where you say that writing? And logographs coexist. Are there conventions that change during that period? Um, no, no, not really. No. Mm -hmm. uh, could can we go back? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. No, I'm good. No, usually running water is um, is uh, depicted with little seashells, like mm -hmm. shells in the in the little. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for example, here we have the sea sh the shells. Yeah, and uh, could we go further back? To the back. Yeah. This one. These are the shells. Yeah. Yeah. This is probably 16th century too, okay. and since it was, it's it's in Vienna. Uh, they think that it was probably sent as a present to, uh, I guess, Charles the, the first. Yeah, because it's in Vienna. It, it, it ended up in Vienna. So, yeah, no, uh, these are the, the conventions remain. Well, many of them. But, uh, yeah, for example, in the, in the maps, in the drawing of maps of uh, colonial... Um, um, I say, um, you know, Plato's I, lawsuits. Yeah. Lawsuits, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. You see that the the person who who drew the the map is has different conventions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's seventeenth uh, and eighteenth centuries. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, a simple question. What about literacy and illiteracy? Who was able to read and write uh, in the old writing system and later? Yeah, uh, to read um, as far as the uh, people or the children went to the either the Kalmekak or the Telposhkali, which were the two institution ed educative institutions, uh, it seems that uh, uh, people read. Now, to write, um, it was an artist. Mm -hmm. The artist mm -hmm. was picked if, at a very young age, mm -hmm. at six or seven, and then he or she would be trained uh, with all, all the knowledge that uh, it meant, because uh, as you can see, the, the, the conventions are there, and there has to be... For example, Quetzalcoatl was born, I think, in the year nine, nine rabbit. So that is information that they had to manage. Mm -hmm. And of, for other information, too, uh, they had to, to know. No, the, the person who, who, who wrote or, or drew a codex, it was an artist. Yeah. And it usually it was born, he or she was born in a... Very precise day. It was born on the name dedicated to this. Um, um, it's called uh, Osomatli, which is the how you say the spider monkey, which has very long arms and very long legs. Yeah, mm -hmm. she, but he is the, like the representative or, or the symbol of, of uh, being able to to read and to well, yeah to be an artist. Be an artist. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. That, that was very interesting, especially the, last, the answer to the last question. <clears throat> so uh, these persons who, who write uh, are, have a very, do they come from a specific background, a social background? Do they form a kind of guild or something like that? Or there will, there will be one question. And what struck me is that <clears throat> during 100 years, 
stories were told twice in different writing systems, more or less, <laughs> if you can simply imagine that writing is a lot of work, and writing things twice is even more work. So what is the reason behind this? May that be attributed to those who were born on the day of the spider monkey, and that is a kind of, I don't know, identity is, is a word that was always used if you don't have an answer, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, for a hundred years, I don't know, colonial regimes, I would say they would, they would suppress maybe different forms of writing, which they didn't, obviously. Why, why is this, for what reason are these stories told twice? Yeah, no, well, they burnt codices. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh, and then uh -huh. you have these other codices who, who still reflect. Yeah, I well, uh, I don't get it. I mean. No, I, um, it must have been to, so that the, both those, uh, call it Spaniards or call it uh, Criollos, uh, who did not know the Mesoamerican writing, reading and writing system had, would be able to read. So and uh, it, so it was. They coexisted. At, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought of uh, being um, having having been written twice, uh, but yeah, that's the way it worked. And there are several colleagues like like this. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, um, and uh, regarding your your first question, um, I don't know. I haven't found any any information about uh, if it came from a very specific background. Uh, you know that uh, if if there were warriors, they were like a high class uh, mm -hmm. uh, a group, right? If they were priests, a very high class group, right? And then came other other um, professions that were not as uh, not classified as. Important, mm -hmm. that important, right? But uh, in the in terms yes, of is that pre-Columbian or post-Columbian or both? Pre, pre, pre. pre. Okay. pre. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, no, no. That's okay. No, um, warriors were very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were very important. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have Richard. And then, uh, um, so thanks also very much. For I really learned a lot from listening to your talk. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I'm, I was uh, struck by, by lots of things, but also your discussion of now the image, uh, it's the, this uh, Mexican war, or the 1540s, this war, and your discussion and showing really how just one image can portray yeah, so much, so much information, yeah, different forms of information. Um, and how this kind of different or longer time period that's kind of condensed in, in this image. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I mean, it, it kind of made me, remind me a bit of some things, or also the, another codex, the uh, codex Exolot, you know, with the, I call it tradition, and which has this, uh, it's larger, the different, different lenses in that, but uh, mm. one uh, big, uh, important one, Shows kind of yeah, this, this really long uh, uh, one of these long migration stories and starting at the top and with uh, footprints that represent uh, the long path that is yeah. taken. Yeah, so really like this large image, but showing a time span of decades or maybe even more time yeah, until this group settles. Um, so yeah, so this kind of is another example for me and uh, yeah, kind of. For me, it maybe it made me wonder a bit about this, how time and space kind of are shown in these codices and how that would have changed with, with alphabetic writing. It's, a, of course, a very different form of portraying such events. So, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, maybe it's a bit more a comment or a question, but uh, if you have some thoughts on that. Um, yeah, um, well, P other people who have studied uh, this um, uh, pay attention, for example, to the places that have as a toponym uh, something that has that refers to um, amatl, mm -hmm. which is paper, basically is paper. And for example, near tequila, which is a very uh, high productive, a very productive uh, area of uh, agave. 
there is a place called Amatitan, which comes from Amat, and about a uh, hundred kilometers uh, further north, in already in the state of Nayarit, there is uh, this other place called Amatlan de Cañas, and which again it refers to Amat, right? Um, and there, or uh, to the name, uh, to the to topo toponyms that uh, come from Ixquiloa, which is to to write and to draw, mm -hmm. to paint. So um, Tlacuil Tlacuilocan, and there's a whole bunch of places with those. So it is believed that, uh, but we have not found evidences that both paper and writing were uh, practiced in a very large area of, of Mesoamerica, but we we don't have the the, the recordings. And um, in the western part of Mexico, which is where I work, um, nothing has been found. Uh, but uh, in clay pots, um, we can see, well, I work with archaeologists, uh, we can see that uh, there is a shared... Um, Iconography, uh, Tlaloc is represented in the same, in, which is the, the rain god, is represented in the very same way that uh, it is represented in, in other areas of Mesoamerica. Um, the same for um, uh, Tlaltecutli, the lady of the, uh, of the earth, or, which is uh, related to fertility and agriculture. So uh, they are represented in the same way, but of course clay pots have survived and not amate or, or, mm -hmm. or agave paper. Yeah, and uh, it seems like um, it was not used in Western area. Uh, for example, it has been found that, uh, that um, there is this codex called Codex Huejotzingo, uh, which is in Puebla, and it seems like uh, the 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 material it is made with uh, comes from Tlaxcala, mm. which is uh, uh, the region where well very close to region to to Huejotzingo, right? So it seems like this area was very a very productive area of agave paper, yeah. Thanks so much, and it's, it's so interesting to have this uh, archaeological perspective from Australia. We've been talking always about this, yeah, the, the burning of the colleges, the books that is really central. So it's, it's interesting if you're working with archaeologists. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Yeah, I have two additional answers to your question. Okay. Um, one is the Codex Mendoza, which you used for this leaflet here, for example, it was the tributary codex. So the Spaniards in the beginning um, continued to extract, uh, to use the pre-Spanish tribute lists. And of course, there the items which had to be handed in are reproduced. Um, so, and, and, but it has also uh, writing on it. So it served both for the people they extracted the tribute from, from for the caciques, but also for the Spaniards who um, got part of the tribute. <coughs> there are several codices which served to legitimize um, possession over certain territories which were destroyed and by then recrafted <clears throat> in the early modern period. And uh, an inter interesting case in this respect is the Lienzo de Jicalan, otherwise known as Jogutacato, which um, my colleague Hans Roskamp has studied for Michoacan, which was actually done in the 17th century, <coughs> but it was made to look like it was Hispanic mm -hmm. um, to legitimize um, the possession of uh, <laughs> certain mines and of land. So there were several functions who explain why these um, pre-Hispanic lookalike codices continue to be used oh. uh, throughout the, well, not the entire colonial period, but well beyond um, the, um, the conquest. And I had a question for you, Rosa, because it's the first time I hear about female uh, tlacuilos. Mm -hmm. um, where, where are the evidence um, for these? Um, you mean pre-Hispanic or? Yeah, pre-Hispanic ones. Oh. Um, they are in the Codice Telleriano Remensis. Ah, okay. There is a picture of, of one of them. Okay. Yeah, and of uh, scribes. I 
as I said, I have documents that that uh, uh, very highly suggest that they were they were women writing. Okay, thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the Codice Tejeriano Romance, you find a, a woman with her, uh, how do you say, with, uh, with her instruments. Yeah. If there is no one else, then I'll, I'll put myself on the list. And also, I, I definitely also wanted to ask the female, the woman scribe or the painter question, um, which is that's super exciting to um, per se. But on the other hand, um, the, the second thing I wanted to maybe not so much ask, but or maybe ask if I understand correctly or what your thoughts are on if we go back to our perspective of, of momentum of its own and maybe trying to look at, I mean, we, we can't look at uh, a state-based uh, sort of issues, so the three are three um, uh, criteria here, but if we look at sort of um, maybe other parallels between um, the writing system um, here that you're showing us and, and maybe, yeah, European writing systems, there are, very strong commonalities apart from the fact that it's a system of glyphs, obviously, and it's not, not alphabetic. But at the same time, the, the, um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know, for example, that, that it was able to sort of um, make intelligible or be, be legible for different um, unrelated languages, which is a, quite an amazing mm -hmm. task to do. And I mean, what you were saying, the whole thing suggests that there was a large scale kind of, uh, yeah, Agreement. Uh, gathering or somehow <laughs> agreement. I mean, that, just the, the imagination of how that came about is, is quite amazing, right? <laughs> so uh, for this to work, um, yeah, which, which are features that are definitely not well enough known. So I mean, this is in a sense of, of um, at least, you know, a, an approximation or, or, yeah, getting close to, to, I mean, if we want to, I mean, I find it very difficult to do these comparisons because then, uh, again, we're like, we're comparing European stuff again, <laughs> other <laughs> areas uh, and, and all, but um, yeah, so in, in the interest of, of our conceptual thing, maybe that's getting towards, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. towards yeah, I have to, to um, give more uh, thought about it because there's a lot of information. I I um I haven't uh, read this professor Gordon Whitaker who's who's here in Germany has um has worked the Zapotec system too mm -hmm. and uh I don't know anything about Zapotec okay. so so yeah That's it's yeah. yeah and he has worked the Maya um system mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. so so uh there is still a long way to go uh, how, yeah, how these conventions uh, were agreed on, or mm. or how they were reached, or or I don't know, and why the Zapotecs, for example, I don't know, I definitely do not know enough about the Zapotecs um, as a group, as uh, how I mean, they probably were influenced by the Olmecs, which are very close by. Well. Kilometers and kilometers, yeah. But um, but anyway, because the Olmecs are supposed to be like the mother <laughs> culture, though they are the ones like the who initiated the um, agriculture. So that's why they are considered very important. But uh, uh, there's still a lot to 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 find out about. Yeah. But with regard to, to change, I had the impression now, again, maybe a little bit like with Richard's um, um, example yesterday, that what we're seeing is more the um, depletion or yeah, loss of an indigenous, uh, rich, very rich indigenous system by, again, I mean, the famous story, obviously, uh, by, by the conquering Spanish, um, rather than so something else or like a, the, this going into both directions or we're seeing like that there is an influence or yeah at least not not so much a visible influence of, of the indigenous <laughs> system on this planet. no no yeah, there so is no is... no um further i mean beyond uh vocabulary that, that there is a lot of vocabulary that has gone into many languages um uh, 
No. No, no. Because even the, the as I said, they become colorless. Writing becomes colorless, just like we we use it now, right? Dark, I mean, black and and blue, right? Another color. But yeah, if you remember, they are very, very uh, colorful. Uh, mm -hmm. Most cases are are colorful, and uh, and um, and to make the colors, to produce the colors, was also something somebody who was uh, a specialized uh, person. In in he had a a, um, a profession. Because it wasn't the artist. You know, not that. necessarily. Not necessarily. In, in there's. In the Florentine Codex or Historia General of uh, Bernardino de Sagún, um, there are some um, uh, paintings where it is the same person, but uh, yeah, it's uh, in, in some places it was somebody different. That, uh, that the, there was someone who would produce the colors and somebody who would do the the painting of the of the Codex. Yeah. I, I, in a way, sorry if I continue. I mean, if anyone else no, has questions, I want to ahead. jump in. We still have to add an aspect, but, uh, <laughs> please. Oh, well, please. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking that well, um, European handwriting gets colorless too. I mean, there are wonderful illuminated yes. handwritings in the. Uh, 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 Middle Ages and uh, during the early modern period, and with the printing press, uh, these colors disappear in a way. For other reasons, of course, but um, it's a similar process in a way. I see. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I see. Well, I, yeah, I wanted, actually wanted to say the same thing. Okay. <laughs> no, but it's like in the printing of books. The first books that the uh, printing machines. Uh, um, produced in, mm -hmm. in New Spain have some um, uh, gravados, I don't know how to say that Engraving. engravings yeah, beautiful I mean, and little by little they, they disappear I mean. same thing with printings in Germany for instance they, are, they have colorful pictures too mm. you know, edited by hand so that's why printing in the first decades was not not always cheaper than, than handwriting. So it was a completely different mix. But I don't know about the 16th and 17th century. I'm completely mm -hmm. Maybe you know. And we have, um, why, why, why are we? If we have to wait until color TV arrives until we get from again. <laughs> Willy Brown pressing the button, you know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Soviet Democratic did that. <laughs> yeah, yesterday I went to a printing, um, to an internet place, and I I had my boarding ticket uh, printed, and he, the, the man asks me, uh, mit Farbe or other? <laughs> Ohne Farbe. Ohne Farbe. <laughs> it's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. So if there are no other questions, we thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all allowed to clap.